Hi guys, I wanted to talk about this for quite some time now. There was an amazing article on GameIndustry.biz, I think is what it's called. Um, and it was with Tom Kalinske, and it was talking about why he left Sega, and also dealing with brands, and how, how hard it is to actually kill a really successful brand. And I thought it was... It was a brilliant article. I'll have a link to it in the description below. But it was it was really something. I learned a lot. Like for example, I didn't know that one of the key reasons why Tom Kalinske left Sega was because there was a real opportunity for Sega and Sony to create one platform, share the development costs and the loss up front. Because you know the way the game industry works, you basically you lose money on the hardware, but you make tons more on software. And they were going to share the profits from software as well, so they could both release a lot of games and stuff on this particular uh, system. And when Sega of Japan basically was like, no, we, you know, we don't want to hear about something like that, that was one of the, uh, the key factors in why Tom left. Now, I, I knew about that deal. But I didn't know that uh, it, it played such a huge impact on him. And he went on to further discuss that him and Nolan Bushnell, actually, that which is the, uh, the founder of Atari, actually tried to work together to buy back the Atari brand back in, I think he said it was 2002, 2004, I don't know, something like that. But that fell through and, um, and, and that's that. And I thought it was really interesting because he was talking a lot about the Sega brand and Atari and Nintendo and things like that. And he was saying how, you know, the only real way to truly kill a successful brand is essentially stupidity. That's the only way that you can truly kill a brand. And I, I kind of looked at that and I was like, you know what, he's absolutely right. Because... Look at Sega. Sega is, is no longer the same company it was back when it made the Sega Genesis, for example, or the Mega Drive. It's, it's not even a shadow of its former self. The brand, the Sega brand, isn't dead. I wouldn't even say that it's dying. I mean, people know what Sega is, but it has been morphed. It's been really changed compared to what it was all those years ago. And it was funny how he was talking about Sonic, for example, and saying how, you know, they're, they're releasing like a bajillion Sonic games, and, and well, this is mainly me um, thinking of this, but it's true, you know, they've released so many different Sonic games, and the quality has been going down, down, down. They have all these other IPs that they haven't used in years, and slowly but surely, the Sega brand is getting really hurt because of this. And it's interesting to see that, you know, Sega really did make one bad business decision after another. Could you imagine if that deal had gone through? Could you imagine if, if Sega and Sony had teamed up um, for some, some console during the uh, PlayStation N64 and Sega Saturn um, era or generation and even further still what's more interesting is silicon graphics actually went to tom kalinsky for the before the n64 before nintendo and asked if sega would be interested in in developing some kind of um, console using their graphics chip software or well not software but hardware and uh, basically again the sega of japan was like no 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 uh, you know we're doing everything in-house and they were an arcade company so i mean i can understand to a, um, to a certain degree, why Sega wanted to keep things internal. I, I, can, I can get that, because they were an amusement company. They made arcade games. But at the same time, you had an incredible businessman working for you. Tom Kalinske, as far as I'm concerned, I consider him like pretty much Sega's ace in the hole. He was directly responsible for the platform's success in North America, and, um, I mean, for God's sakes, for a while, for, for a portion, they actually beat Nintendo in North America in terms of market share. That's insane to think that Nintendo had something, I forget what it was, but it was like 96 or 98% of the market. 
and Sega would actually beat them for, uh, you know, for a few, I don't know if it was a few years or a year or, or whatever, but still, the point is that they did it. That, that was incredible. They did the impossible. And almost all of that rests on the shoulders of Tom Kalinske. And to think that, you know, he had the foresight to actually say, you know what, if Sony, if an entertainment company like Sony, an electronics company like Sony, wants to get into the game industry, why not share that, that brand that, you know, like their, their expertise in, um, in electronics, why not share that with the Sega brand that everybody knows for gaming? Because at one point, Sega really was like synonymous with video games. People knew it was like you were playing on Sega or you were playing on Nintendo. That was, or, you know, some of us we were lucky we, we were playing on both. And for him to have that foresight to see that, you know, you know, Sega was already sort of uh, appealing to an older demograph, but for him to have like the foresight to say, you know what, we could not only appeal to a larger, like not the larger, but an older demograph, but now we could bring on all kinds of other people with Sony by teaming up with Sony on this platform. Now, imagine that and then couple that potentially with like the, the, the chip that essentially made the N64 what it was. Could you imagine had Sega like teamed up with Sony for this platform, threw in the silicon graphics uh, chip, man, that could have been one hell of a beastly uh, console. But I mean, obviously you know the story, it wasn't meant to be, but I thought it was really interesting how Tom is, it was like really open about this and he was saying how um, how that you know Sega's done a lot of mistakes over the last 20 25 years and it's what's bringing them down it's what's brought them to this point right now in the company's um, history where you know as far as I'm concerned this is the all-time low uh, I know like profitability it, it, it's been going like this but the fact is, we haven't seen so many IPs that the company has in forever because they need to bank on Sonic because they gotta, they have to guarantee that they're going to get money. And it's just, it's so sad to see that, especially when you read an article like this and Tom's telling uh, like this tale of while he worked there and, and the brand and how it's been going downhill. And he said, like, it's not over. You know, you, you, you never count anyone out of it like Atari. He was saying that, like, you know, Atari could very easily, the brand could come back. He's not talking about, oh, we're going to make a new Atari console, nothing like that. But just that that brand is not truly dead. It's still around. It's just that it needs some, you know, tender, loving care to be brought back to the, uh, the mainstream. And he's absolutely right. Like, Sega is not dead. The brand is not dead. But due to so many mistakes that, you know, the company really needs to, to turn things around internally and realize, like, we have a very strong brand. If we, if we are smart about this, we could really turn the brand around. And he was talking also about edutainment. Uh, he actually now runs, or I forget if he runs or if he's on the board, of a company called Leapfrog, I believe it is, and um, they specialize in proprietary hardware and software solutions for edutainment. That's basically um, education games or interactive education um, software. And he was saying how, like today, you know, that's a problem because you want stuff on your phone and on your tablets and and things like that and. He's right. Uh, he was saying about Nintendo too, like not to leave the hardware business, but he said like, would it really damage the brand to say put Nintendo games on this? Would it? Would it really? Would it tarnish anything if they made, I mean, like right now uh, on the Wii U, for example, there, it's an emulator that's running those, those games, those classic NES games. And he was saying like, would it, would it really hurt to introduce the mobile generation to classic NES games by putting them on this. Now, I know, I know the people watching this channel, I completely understand you guys aren't into, aren't into the mobile scene or whatever, but this, we're talking business now. And looking at it from a business perspective, you know, he's not, I don't think he's wrong. I don't think he's wrong at all. I don't see how that would damage Nintendo's brand 
by introducing new players who are literally going to grow up. This will be someone's uh, Game Boy. And this, let me grab this, this will be someone's console. Someone. This will be their gaming device. And I've seen it. I have seen it firsthand with people at work. Their children, um, when they come into the office, for example, and they're, they're, you know, they go to the staff lounge and they sit down and, and whatever, their parents give them one of these or they give them one of these and they're on there, you know, they're, they're doing their thing, playing uh, certain games. And would it hurt the brand to have Super Mario Brothers on that, to have um, uh, The Legend of Zelda on that? Now, again, I'm not talking about new titles here. I'm talking about the original NES classics. Would it harm the brand? Because if they're being introduced to these games in an official capacity, they could just as easily have, you know, a commercial that runs or an advertisement or whatever that runs when they play the game um, saying, you know, uh, experience the latest Legend of Zelda exclusively on the Wii U, as an, uh, you know, as an example. And I think he's right about that. I really do. I think that you know, bringing on these new, like understanding where this market is going, what children are playing today, what they're being uh, introduced to, and capturing that and going after that market, I think is smart, and that will help extend one's brand. It's why I think it's very smart that Microsoft and uh, Sony are, are pushing um, like their little applications and things like that. And I think it is smart that, you know, and actually very relevant that you will see a PlayStation app. You will see uh, an Xbox app one day uh, for all of these different devices because if this is where society is going, you know, maybe not to make the games exclusive for that just yet. I mean, I think eventually that's where we're going. But in, in the interim, right now, I think it, it's smart. If you, can, if you can bring on a new user base, why the heck not? That brings your, your brand to a new level. And if you can only get these new games on PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, the Wii U, well, that's okay. You're still, you know, you still got your lock. You're still an exclusive platform. But if you can release some of your older content, potentially on these other devices, introduce new gamers and new players, you might, you know, give them an incentive to go and check out, <clears throat> excuse me, your new console. And I keep looking down because that's where my consoles are. But anyways, um, so that's pretty much it. It turned into a longer video than I thought. But the, the point of this was I just wanted to talk a little bit about this article because I really, I enjoyed reading about Tom again. He was, uh, he was such an awesome uh, business person and I miss him in the gaming industry. I really do. He had some amazing foresight. I mean, he made a few mistakes along the way too. I think it's natural. They, everyone has. But I, I miss him. I really do. I miss him being in the spotlight and talking about uh, the future of video games and where, you know, potentially they could go and things like that. So it was just nice to read an article on Tom again. And, um, and that's it. So that's it, guys. Uh, what do you think about brands and, and like for Sega or for Nintendo or maybe even Sony and Microsoft or Atari? Um, what, do you, what do you think? I mean, do you agree with that? That pretty much any of those brands, they're still salvageable, even if they've been dragged through the mud just because of what they represented at one point in time. Now, again, I'm not talking, when I talk about like Atari, he, he's very clear. He's not talking about, let's make the, the Puma hardware or something like that. No, he's not talking about that at all. Just saying that the brand, people still know what Atari is. And through smart and strategic business decisions, that brand could be brought back to the mainstream in some way. So anyways, uh, if you thought this was an interesting conversation, leave a comment below and maybe we can uh, extend it a little bit further. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.